I'm Deep. I'm Jose. And we're your token theater friends, people who love theater so much that it's our sunshine on a cloudy day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dominic Mauricio, do you appreciate the corniness of that? I hope you do. <laughs> because she's the person we're talking to today. And tell us more about her, Jose. Dominic Mauricio is the book writer of A2 Proud the Temptations musical, now open on Broadway. She's also a fantastic playwright. You might know her work in plays like Paradise Blue, which we reviewed. Yep. Uh, Detroit 67, The Skeleton Crew. Blood at the Roots, and so, 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 so many other extraordinary So many, works. so many plays. And she's more, much more interesting than we are, so let's just go look at the interview. Dominic, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, we're both huge fans of your work, and I feel that, you know, music has always been such an essential part of your plays mm -hmm. that I felt that Dominic in a musical was like just like the logical next step yeah. so why did you want to write a book for a musical especially a musical about the temptations um you know i i had this list at the top of 2015 which is when this project came to into my lap really um and uh at the top of the list you know it was like you write 10 things that scare you and then <laughs> you try to do like half of those things that year <laughs> and at the top of my number two on my list was write a musical mm -hmm. so uh i want when it came when I, and this was before the project came on board you know i just thought okay how i want to try to like manifest that this year and like try to see if i can start my own so when it came to me and it was the temptations i was like oh man like i love them this is it this is this is the thing i need to do this and i'm terrified i don't even know how you do this but i feel like mm -hmm. i want to learn um and so that, that for, that's the reason why I, I it was on my mind to do it because i love music because my plays do are very infused with music often, and I think I hear musicality and language. You know what I mean. So I, I wanted to, I just wanted to stretch myself and see if I could do it in a musical. You know, in the musical genre, and um, and I I really love it. I love their music so much, and I love music so much. And when I'm, I love the soulfulness of the music. And so for me, because when I think of musicals, I always go, I want to hear something that's like music that I want to hear like on the radio. You know, I mean, I love musicals, but I, I just always want to hear something that, not that I want to hear like top 40 musicals, but I just- I'd watch that. Right, 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 <laughs> but maybe. But I want to hear something that like, I, I don't want it to just, I don't want there to be a separation. Mm -hmm. from theater to like what the people are listening to that don't have never seen a play you know i want there to be a fusion so that when you come and see it it feels very um integrative instead of like you know like elite and you don't know what this is and you have to change <laughs> your whole philosophy of life to really be able to embrace this i don't i wanted to try something a little different than that the Temptations were based in Detroit, and you grew up in Detroit, and yeah. so for someone who grew up there, like, what what's the mythos around the band in your hometown? What was it like, like doing paying tribute to such a, you know, yeah, such such an iconic part of Detroit? You know, uh, <laughs> Detroiters have such ownership over the Temptations, you know, um, whether the Temptations like that or not, <laughs> and I think that. Because of that, there's so much like expectation for like you better get it right, you know. <laughs> and um, luckily, I just don't respond to those things. <laughs> but but there's a lot of that, and I think people are relieved when they find out I'm a home girl, you know, writing the mm -hmm. book. They but I'm also younger than their generation, so they're still gonna be like, so. But what do you really know? I still have friends of mine that go, oh, well, you know, this temptation is this person's cousin. You know, I mean, everybody's related to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they have a different. I story about a very much more personal story about them than I think people from other places have more of a story about what their music was for them in the time period. But but in um in Detroit it's also about who they personally were to different Detroiters. Do you think it's like a fourth installment of your Detroit cycle? I mean, <laughs> it'd be the most epic <laughs> installment ever. You know, I don't I just feel like it's a uh it's a it's an extension or a friend of it, you know what I mean? It's like it's a cousin, it's a distant cousin of the cycle. Michael Freeman um, 
I feel like the gift he gave to me before he passed was when he was talking to Tom Hulse about the, the this Temptations musical. Michael said to Tom, you, you're you doing a Temptations musical about Detroit. You need Dominique Marisa. And they started reading my work. I think they read Detroit 67. Mm -hmm. And Detroit 67, the character Shell at the beginning of the play, is listening to Ain't Too Proud to Beg by the Temptations. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, Ira Pittleman was always going, I, it was like fate. You know, and mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, well, that's so dope. So there is a connection between the, my my Detroit cycle and, and being chosen to write this book. And then, you know, in the play, I mean, in the musical, we deal with, there's a moment where we actually deal with the Detroit riots again, you know. So there's that crossover that I think is um, is a connection between those things. The Temptations are still making music, I think, in a different iteration, obviously. And they've been making music for decades. Yeah. And when they gave you, you know, like, you have decades worth of their music. Yeah. How do you go, what songs do we want to feature? Like, did you go, I want to include personal favorites, while also including the ones, obviously, everyone knows. And what yeah. was that process like? Uh, you know, so we had a list of approved songs. My director, Des Mackinoff, and mm -hmm. I, we sat at Des's apartment. I mean, not his apartment. <laughs> he has, like, this big house. I'm like, his apartment. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's me projecting myself. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we met at his home, and uh, we sat down for hours and went through. We would listen to all of the songs that were on the approved song list and just kind of extract ones that both either he was passionate about or I was passionate about. I mean, many were no-brainers. Like, you're not going to do it without my girl. Mm -hmm. you, get, mm -hmm. you know, the Temptations will even tell you that one time they removed my my girl from their set and got this, you know, booze. So they said they would never, ever remove my girl from their lineup ever again, you know. So, of course, we can't. Um, but, you know, so there, there are other songs, you know, that I think, like, the way you do the things you do, get ready, ain't too proud to beg, that are obvious. And then there were songs, you know, that we would listen to and, 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 and some of them are from the psychedelic era and you know you, we weren't going to use every song from the psychedelic era so we had to be very selective about that and some Des loved or I loved or some that he didn't really know what to do with I was like I think this is a, a one example is Runaway Child Running Wild which is mm -hmm. sort of our second song in the, in the, in the show it's not like a, it's not that everybody doesn't know the words to all the lyrics of that song. It's maybe not their most popular song. But for me, it felt so classically narrative. You know, like I was like, this is a narrative. He was a kid back in the day, like on, you know, growing up in Detroit and getting into trouble. This is the perfect song for that. You know, so we would figure those kind of things out like that and go, some of the songs made sense. Thematically, some of them made sense just in terms of the temptation's trajectory, and then some of them, for me, made sense narratively, and that's how we selected them. You know, um, I wish it would rain when I, when we selected. I just love that's my favorite temptation song, one of. Some of my other favorite songs by the Temptations aren't even in the show, but that <laughs> one is is like one of my favorites. And selecting like how to put that in the show. We had to, you know, my girl, for instance, you know, it's like a lot of debate on how to use that song because that's like their big song. And there wanted to be all this like introduction of the song. And I thought, uh-uh, no introduction. Mm -hmm. We are all waiting for my girl. So we can't drop it in when people think it has to. We have to not make a big event out of it. We have to kind of make a non-event out of it. I guess you say. Talking about my girl, my girl. You and Terrell are the only are the only people of color writing on Broadway right now this is that, season. Is that really true? Mm -hmm. Oh wow, wow. So, so what have mm. you learned in this experience about how to make space for yourself in the commercial theater space where there's not very many people of color and you, you're pioneering? Yeah. You know. It's challenging. I mean, someone brought this fact up recently that I am the second black woman book writer 
to write a musical, you know. And mm-hmm. I thought, well, that's strange. The first one is Vanette Carroll, who wrote Your Arms Too Short to Box of God in, like, 1974. Or oh, Jesus. Yeah, or, like, 1976. It was in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? Really? Is that true? Because I know. Now, I saw Porgy and Best of Revival, and, and Susan, Susan Laurie did mm-hmm. that adaptation. But I guess maybe that's not the exact same, you know. She did the adaptation of the book. But I guess maybe original book on of a musical. That's a, st- a shocking um, number to me that I would be two in 2019. You know. Um, so anyway, that that go to show you <laughs> how not used to this <laughs> the the culture maybe. You know, and so when I want to bring all of myself, it's sort of a non-negotiable for me, at least on the stage, I'm going to bring all of myself. And Mm -hmm. if that's not what you want, then you just don't want me as your writer. And I'm okay with that. I've really gotten to a peaceful place about that. Um, But it's what happens off the stage that I don't have as much control over, especially in a bigger market, that I can push for things, but... Um, you know, of making space for different audiences. But, I mean, there's every, from everything to marketing to, you know, just like the programmatical things, you know, that I find challenging um, to do the things that I can do off Broadway. You know, mm-hmm. like put, you know, name my inserts, you know, put my inserts about audience participation. Like suddenly that becomes a much bigger corporatized deal you know, in the commercial arena, mm-hmm. um, you know, doing things, just, just the ways in which the, uh, the non-conventional things, you know, to get people of color into the house, those efforts are, uh, are shied away from in commercial um, space, yes. you know, and I don't, I, I, I can only honestly attribute it to fear of the unknown. Because there's no logic for it, right? It is just, it is simply fear. Like, well, this works. Let's only do what has always worked. Yeah. Let's not try to do what hey, nobody knows works, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, and white I, people have all the money. So, white people have all the money. So, let's keep catering to them because mm-hmm. we know that they have money. <laughs> we're not sure about other people, <laughs> but we're confident that this group has money. This, this age group and this demographic, you know, mm-hmm. we're confident that they have money. So, let's go on to them. And I find that exhausting, you know, um, and just, and I'm, I'm, I'm still figuring out how to make space for new ideas, to try to be a, the vanguard of new ideas in commercial spaces. And, and I think it's tough because it comes down to commerce. But mm-hmm. I wish the whole entire theater game, the whole commercial theater game would wake up like the like the film industry is doing. Yeah. Because they are seeing the power of dollars and representative stories of people of color and their audiences. Because you cannot mm-hmm. separate us from our audience. Mm-hmm. You can't separate it. You can't have us without our, our audience. You can't have us without the communities we come from. And I think that there's still mm, a little bit of an old mentality that, that somehow people of color are supposed to be on that stage performing that does not have to match the house. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, I vehemently disagree with that pedagogy. So I I am pushing for a new way of thinking, moving, and acting. Because a lot of talk happens, but a lot of talk is cheap. I I read that um, you started writing plays when you were in the second grade. Yeah. And and I just wonder, you know, now you're on Broadway. Yeah. and, And I wonder if, you know, what has made you... What excites you the most about what we can do today that, you know, maybe you didn't even think about? I don't know if, you know, Mm -hmm. if you ever thought that you were going to be on Broadway when you were in the second grade. Yeah. Now here you are. No, I I didn't. And I I didn't conceive of it because I didn't know the journey of theater at that point yet. I had seen plays, you know, and I was getting exposed to plays in the second grade, but I had no idea. Of the of the breadth and the span of and the reach of theater, I knew TV. I had vision TV, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I did not envision theater. Uh, you know, and but I feel what I see now really excites me. My husband and I have been going to see a lot of like the new plays that are out. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, and we're kind of consistently like noticing something about these plays that are like just a little more. Uh, the, it's not even just, it's unapologetic, but there's something else. It's a very in-your-face moment. It's some very, there's a different way that they are na- navigating 
these spaces, the different than my generation or, you know, the people that I came up with, I should say, you know. And my husband was like, you know, it's kind of like they're like doing, you know, there's like hip hop. We're kind of like the 90s hip hop generation. And now there's like the trap music generation. And he was like, we're kind of like the hip hop, the 90s hip hop theater movement. And they're the trap theater movement. And I was like, yes, it's like trap theater. And I'm here for it. Would you like to invite our viewers to come see? The Temptations musical. Yeah. And if there's any like audience engagement projects or development yeah. projects for like younger or POC audiences to yeah. come, like tell us about that too. Yeah, I mean, well, I would first of all, I'm always on a mission to get people to sponsor a young person to come see a show. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out to me. You can follow me on Facebook. You can reach out to me and inbox me on Instagram at Dio Mariso uh, or Dominique Mariso on Facebook. Um, I am also very interested in groups of young people just coming in general. I will Skype with your class if you bring them to our show, so please let me know. You know, I really will. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I just, I, I want everyone, you know, to feel free when you do come to see Ain't Too Proud. Uh, from whatever community that you come from, feel free to come and be your authentic self in that house. There is space for you. We have made space for you in our show. You will feel it when you are there. That it is, if you are a call and responder, there is space for you. If you are a silent observer, there's also space for you there too. And so we kind of welcome everybody, but please feel free to carry my rules of engagement with you should you need them. And you can point them out to anybody that has questions about us. <laughs> we, we have the links. If we must, we'll be outside giving people yeah, care. That's right. You can do it. Even You might not see them in the insert, in the program, but they are online. And you can always say, Dominique Mariso has said this. And I was, I stand by it. I still mm -hmm. co-sign it. So you are welcome to share that whenever you come. Yeah. <laughs> the book writer said that I can make noise. You cannot shush me. The book writer said I can make noise. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. And congratulations. I'm so excited that thank your name's you. on Broadway. Oh, thank you guys. It's meaningful to me. Thank you for giving me time, airtime, all the time. All you the have time. been like down from the beginning <laughs> of like just letting me get the thing said and pushing me to get it said, actually. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate you for that. And thank you guys for having me on your podcast. Thank you. Does that Temptations count as a boy band? Because I think they were kind of like one of the first boy bands. Oh, crap. Well, I was telling you how they're kind of like the Destiny's Child because... <laughs> Destiny Child of boy bands because the members kept on rotating. Mm, that's true. But if, mm -hmm. if, if you could turn like a boy band into a musical, what boy band would you choose? The Backstreet Boys! <laughs> that was easy. That was so easy. <laughs> Is there even a question? This is going to be Britney Spears musical, so I, even though I do not approve of, of jukebox musicals, I will watch any jukebox musical from a band in the 90s because that was when I was young and it will make me feel young again. Aww. Which I guess is the appeal of jukebox musicals? Maybe? Uh, Maybe? Yeah, yeah. And like mine would be like super niche, so for all of our British viewers and listeners, I guess, I would go see a five musical, like Whoa! It's not that like super niche. They had like one album. That would be the shortest jukebox musical ever. They have way more than one album. But anyway, I'll I'll show that to you later. Okay, Send then maybe out. when the lights go out, you know. Ooh. Which one of your favorite artists do you want? Do you want to see get turned into a musical? Let us know in the comments below. And if you love us and want more Token Theater friends, you should subscribe and listen to our podcast because this week we are reviewing Kiss Me Kate. Did we want to kiss her? Well, you're going to find out. <laughs> well, and that's our show. Thank you all for watching. And remember, theater is more fun when you take a friend, especially if you want to create your own boy band and take them all to the, to the theater. And also bring Dominique's rules of engagement. Those exactly. Are best friend at the theater. And also, don't shush people. No shushing of other people. Bye bye. bye.